You're all very, very welcome to the third half, everybody. Freddie, who's next? Thank you so much, Tommy. Well, our next guest is Mike Scott from the Water uh. Boys! Hello, friend. Hello, Tom. How are you, brother? I'm good, thank you. Wow. Now, how are you? Not too bad. Really? Hanging in there. Really? Yeah. It's funny, just before the show started, um, I th was thinking about uh, something that I might say to a guest, you know, in terms of yeah. how I'm doing. And I get the sense that I'm, at the same time, on an exploration, as well as hanging in by the skin of my teeth. Do you that? If if you were asked to describe yourself, how would you do that? Uh, I'm doing all right, Tommy. I, I've got a weird situation. My, my wife and my little boy are, are in Japan while it's all going down. They'll be back soon, but how soon is soon? I don't yet know. Mm. So I miss them very, very much. I, but on the other hand, I'm getting to spend an incredible amount of time with my seven-year-old daughter. Yeah, that is wonderful. And I'm also getting a lot of time to work. Of course, I'm not stepping out on the stage, yeah. doing you know my favourite postures and stuff. But, yeah. I, but I'm doing a lot of work in my studio. I've, I've, I've finished an album. I've mixed two other albums. I've, I've done a box set. I've done six or seven videos. Mm. I've written a book. So I'm really busy day to day. And and I guess if I didn't have that, I, I might say to you, I'm going mad, Ted. Yeah. 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 I remember, the, I remember the first time I saw you in the flesh. Uh, it was when you were stepping off the boat on the pier in Inish Moor. Whoa! Yeah. You were there. I, I was there, <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. And I remember because uh, it looked like happiness. Yeah. You know, all the photos from that time and the, the fact that the music would have brought you to small places. Yeah, well, that was part of our you dream to, to play all the towns of Ireland. You know, the big bands would play Belfast, Cork, Galway, uh, and Dublin. Sometimes even just just Belfast and Dublin. And yeah. I could never understand that. Even big Irish bands, uh, and, and we wanted to open up the whole circuit. And, and I, I remember going and, and sitting with Dennis Desmond, who was our booking agent for mm. Ireland in those days. Going down to he had his nice office overlooking the sea at Kalini. He'd done very well already, uh, uh, and and he sat with me, and we looked. We had a huge map of Ireland, and I would go. Is there somewhere to play here? Can, yeah. you know, Kilty Mock. Or, can we play here? Can we play Mallow? That sounds fun. And he said, Oh, there's a majestic ballroom in Mallow, and and we played about I don't know dozens of shows around yeah. Ireland. And for me, I don't know about the Irish members of the band, but for me, coming from another country, it was like. It was like going through the the looking glass. It was magic. But that must be that like that must. I have no problem playing different sized rooms as long yeah, as they're full. Either. Yeah, you know, yeah. I, I play to five people if it's a five seater. Yeah. <laughs> you know, our last gig before all the lockdown stuff happened was in a, a, a bull ring in Lisbon. It was fantastic. Seven or eight thousand people. They went absolutely mental. It was one of the best Water Boys gigs ever. I'm grateful. Yeah. That my last memory of being on stage for this long layoff was that. That's wonderful. Yeah. yeah. Um, what was your upbringing like? You grew up in Edinburgh? Until uh, I was 12, and then yeah. I was a teenager in Ayr in the west of Scotland. Yeah. And was, was it a... Can you see differences between that upbringing? Edinburgh is such a beautiful city, mm. but it, it can be kind of uh, tight in the head. It can, uh, yes. <laughs> So, uh, the west of Scotland is so beautiful. Is that tight in the head as well? They're very, very different, because oh, I've experienced both. Uh, yeah. They're very different. And when I lived in Ayr, the big nearby town was Glasgow. Oh. So I, I feel free of both cities. I know them so, so well. Mm. Yeah. Well, I mean, I suppose the thing about Edinburgh is it's, Edinburgh is almost a monument to the genius of the industrial age, isn't it? It's so... And the intellect. I think so. Yes. It's, uh, maybe it's that... Um, I always think that, that Protestants are... They're, they're kind of, they have a lot in common with Zen, Buddhists. There's a kind of an austerity. Uh, Catholics, I think, are like, we're like the Hindus. It's all about colour and excess. Whereas the Protestants, I think, are about Zen. It's all very headstrong. Mm. But Edinburgh's like that, isn't it? It's a very... Uh, it's a rigorous place. I, think. I have no truck with either. With? 
Protestant or Catholic religions. No truck with them whatsoever, sir. And not qualified to comment. Mm. But you did live in Findhorn. I did. I did. <laughs> so Findhorn is a strange community. Um, mm. Spiritual uh, community. Yes. So it's spiritual without dogma. Is that right? Yeah, without a capital S. And people of many different traditions and um, religious backgrounds. And how, how was your time spent there? Well, I was there, I had two periods there, Tommy. When I first went there, I was mostly a guest in the community. And, and I was, it was, it's an educational community. It's kind of like a, a spiritual university. Yeah. And I was doing courses and, and living in the community and working in the community. I worked in the kitchens. It was fantastic. It was absolutely amazing. It was good for my rock star ego as well. So just to say, for, for people who might yeah. know, this is after... This is the early 90s, yeah. So this uh, is after being, after being phenomenal, you're in a kitchen in a spiritual it, it, community. In a community, cooking for 100 people. And they had community concerts uh, every Friday night. And, and I, I really fancied playing. And, and I had to kind of go cap in hand to the, the chief of the concerts, who was a, a fearsome American woman. Called, uh, and, and, and I had to say, look, I, I play guitar and sing. And she said, you can have three minutes. <laughs> and the funniest thing is, I went and I did my best, you know, I had a little song to sing and I did my best. And then I was completely upstage by the Builders Group drag show. Really good for the rock star ego. Put you in your place. Yeah. Totally. So when you said you, it was an educational, spiritual yeah. place, yeah. Like, and you did courses, like courses in what? It's hard to explain. Um, I did do some week-long courses there. I did a, a meditation course. I did a, a men's sexuality workshop. That was fascinating and terrifying. I'll tell you one of the things they had us do, Tommy. Uh, the, the, lead, the group leader said, well, today I've got some clay. And he brought in this huge big bag of clay. What on earth was going to happen? And he said, I want you all to sculpt your erect penises. So there we are, 20 men of different ages. I was one of the younger ones. Uh -huh. And we all had to sculpt our erect penises. It was fascinating. And there was... Because, <laughs> of course, it brings up so much stuff. Because men and their penises... <laughs> it's the one thing, you know, we never talk about. Uh -huh. And one guy... He, <laughs> he built a little platform <laughs> to put it on so that it looked bigger. <laughs> and then, then, the coup de grace, the group leader said, no. I want you all to tell the story of your penis in the penis's voice. <laughs> so everybody had to tell the story of their penis. Oh yes, I've been sad and I did this and this happened to me and it was fascinating. I don't remember anything that any other guy said yeah. now, but because it, it, it's 30 years ago, but it was fascinating. And can you remember the, like, the, <clears throat> my, if I was involved in such a, a catastrophic project, uh, I'd probably, oh, like if I had to put a, if I, if, if I had to give yeah. my penis a voice, it would be, oh, well. <laughs> I think some people did things like that, yeah. Some of, some of, them, some of them were very funny. Yeah, it was wow. terrifying as well. Yeah. When he told us what you're going to sculpt your erect penis, this wave of fear went through the Of group. course, yeah, yeah, yeah. And um, when you left there, did you, did you feel... And came back to the world, you Yeah, mean. did you feel that it had changed you or that... Or ah, grand? yes, it had. Of course it had, yeah. I learned a whole lot, yeah. Yeah, hugely changed me, yeah. In what ways? I learned to trust myself, mostly, Tommy. Do you know, when I was writing songs back in my early days, I would get little kind of instructions from inside. I'd have a song like, I remember writing Medicine Bow, which was on one of the early Waterboys albums, and it was three verses and a recurring chorus. And I thought it was finished, but I had this little itch inside that seemed to be saying to me, no, there's something else, there's something else. Maybe it was my penis talking. And, and it's I a thought, fine voice for a penis. Yes, yes thank you. <laughs> uh, and I thought, well, what, what else could it be? And the voice inside seemed to be saying, a bridge, bridge, bridge. So I wrote the bridge bit, which is the bit that changes in the middle before which, you, Now, which bit is that uh, in terms of the I'm words? I'm going to change my colours, cancel my things, and it sets wow. up the third Stop verse. Stop my squawk and grow some wings. That's it. Yeah. yeah. Sets up the third verse, adds momentum, lifts us to the end, bingo, and suddenly it was finished. Mm. And I'd learned to trust that little 
itch inside. When something wasn't quite ready, I wasn't going right. Same in the hole of the moon. Just trust the itch and I'll get there. And when I went to Findhorn and I lived there, I, I learned that that itch was kind of, that was my inner voice. Yeah. And I could actually use it not just in songwriting, but in, in any circumstance that presented itself. And I could try kind of stop talking, stop my squawking and all that, and, and yeah. just try and hear the itch. What was he saying? Uh, does this feel okay? Does this not feel okay? And I learned that some of the worst decisions I ever made in my life were the ones where I had ignored that little itch. So being a Finnhorn taught me how to, how to hear myself, mm. how, to, how, to, how to trust myself. That was a great gift. Do you have brothers and sisters? I have a half-brother and a half-sister. And, yes. and what, where in the world are they and what do they do? They live near Birmingham. Oh, yeah. They're my dad's second family. All right. Yeah. Um, so did your dad hit the road? I mean, I, I, I'm using soft so words speak, here. Yeah. And I don't want to be... Mm. Uh, I don't want to, to make something that might have been hard, very fluffy. Yeah. But um, your, your dad left, and then it was yourself and your mom in, yeah. in Edinburgh and then going to the west of Scotland. Yes. Wow. My dad left when I was eight. Yeah. Yeah. I tracked him down many, many years later in Solihull near Birmingham, uh, and with my second wife. <laughs> Just a I went there. I went there on a Saturday, because I thought he was more likely to be in the house on a Saturday. Yeah. Uh, didn't, didn't get in touch to say I was coming, because, you know, I didn't know why my dad had left. He might, if he knew I was coming, he might not be there. So we turned up and knocked on the door, and, and this lad came to the door. And he was about 11 years old. And that's my half-brother. And he didn't know I existed. Mm. And he wouldn't let us in because we were kind of bohemian looking yeah. weirdos on the street in a housing estate uh, outside, outside Solihull. Uh, uh, and so we waited. And, and after half an hour, my dad drove up. There he was. I hadn't seen him for 28 years. Mm. Uh, and I could sort of recognize him. Yes, of course it was him. Mm. Uh, and. We spoke to him and he was very, very surprised and, and oh, I always knew this day would come, he said, with the tragedians flourish. And then he, he said, come into the house and he turned around and as he walked into the house, I looked at the back of his head and the way that his hair curled in the back of his head, it was exactly as I remembered. Wow. And we became pals. Wow. Great pals. Mm. Are, are you good to yourself? Yes, I think so. What do you mean? Are you kind to yourself? I think so, yes. Yes. There's only one person I care about what they think of me, and that's me. That's, yeah. that's something you're born with, though, isn't it? That, that confident self-sufficiency. I haven't always been confident. No, I used to, I used to be terribly unconfident. I remember when I started out, I don't know how long, how long we're going on for, but I'm happy to keep talking yeah, to you. Sure. When, when I began as a, as a stage performer, I was very natural, and I didn't think about what I was doing. I didn't think, okay, I'm going to stick my leg out here now, I'm going to do that now. It just all happened. I just did it naturally. Mm. Uh, and I had my teenage bands, and I had my first professional band, and we would play around Edinburgh mostly. This was in the late 70s. This was a, post-punk new wave band and I remember we, we were called Another Pretty Face and we had a sport gig at Tiffany's which was a big nightclub in Edinburgh and we had a mate there his name was Johnny Waller and he came to see us and he didn't like us and he thought we were his phrase was shitey rock and rollers and he, he gave us this long lecture I don't know why I didn't kick him in the balls or something, but he yeah. gave us this long lecture in the dressing room. Who do you think you are, you bunch of shitey rock and rollers? And it was really a lot of nonsense, but it had a strange effect on me. I suddenly became self-conscious. I was just thinking about it a few days ago. That's mm -hmm. the moment when I became self-conscious. And from then on, when I would go on stage, I suddenly was conscious of what I was doing, and I kind of lost, lost the rhythm of my yeah, legs. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Sure, you know what I mean. Mm -hmm. And it took me years to kind of learn my way back. Even now, I'm still self-conscious when I'm on stage. I never will get that early, original naturalness back. 
Is your mum still alive? Yes, she is, yeah. Wow. Yeah. And how old is she now? Oh, I, I couldn't say. It's a lady's age. No, no, no. Older than me. Yeah, well, that's... <laughs> Are you in touch a lot? Yeah, well, we FaceTime every day. Because I can't go and visit at the moment. She lives in the west of Scotland. Yeah. But we FaceTime every day. And how is she coping? She's doing very, very well. She's in great spirits. We yeah. have a lot of laughs together. Good for her. Yeah. You know. Wow. Well, um, it's a pleasure talking to you, Mike. And, and, oh, and you, Tony. Uh, yeah. Um, and, yeah, God bless you, and, and Thank thanks you. for coming onto the show. You're very welcome. My pleasure. And now...